Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to our webinar today on the Digital Markets Act, Reshaping Europe's Digital Economy. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the digital group here at the IIEA. It's my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished speaker, Andreas Swab, member of the European Parliament and the European Parliament's Rapporteur for the Digital Markets Act. You're very welcome, Andreas, and I'm delighted that you're joining us today. There is no better person, I think, to talk about the Digital Markets Act. And thank you so much for being with us and for taking time out of your busy schedule. We appreciate it very much. Andreas will speak to us for around 15 minutes, and then I will go to your audience for your questions. You can join our discussion using the Q&A at the bottom of our screen. Please feel free to send in your questions during Andreas' presentation, and I'll come to them once Andreas has finished his presentation. As ever the case, today's presentation and the Q&A is on the record. Please use Twitter and join our discussion using the handle at IIEA. Now, today's webinar is very timely. Just a few weeks ago on March the 24th, the Council of the European Union and the European Parliament reached a provisional political agreement on the Digital Markets Act, one of the world's most far-reaching laws to address the dominance of the very large digital technology companies, potentially reshaping app stores, online advertising, e-commerce and messaging service, as well as other everyday digital tools. It will, I think, transform how Europe's digital economy works. Europe is cementing its leadership as the most assertive regulator of tech companies, such as Apple, Google, Amazon, Meta, and Microsoft. We have seen that European standards are often adopted worldwide, and the latest legislation raises the bar by potentially uh, bringing the companies under a new era of oversight, just like healthcare, transportation and the banking industries. The agreement on the legislative follow, legislation followed ar around 16 months of talks and negotiations, a speedy pace for such legislation. It sets the stage for a final vote in the parliament and among representations of the 27 member states. As you would expect, the adoption of the Digital Markets Act faced many hurdles. Policymakers dealt with what commentators said was one of the strongest lobbying efforts ever seen in Brussels. They also dealt with the concerns of the Biden administration that the rules unfairly target American companies. Andreas Schwab was and is at the heart of this debate and the development of the Digital Markets Act. Andreas will outline for us the development of the DMA since the Commission's initial proposal and will discuss what future the DNA might have uh, in terms of Europe's digital economy. Andreas has a distinguished record as a member of the European Parliament, which he joined in 2004, as coordinator of the EPP group in the Internal Market Committee of the European Parliament, Andreas has helped to successfully steer key pieces of legislation through Parliament. He also authored important resolutions of the European Parliament, including those on supporting consumers' rights in the Digital Single Market Act in 2014, as well as the report on digital taxation 2021. Before becoming an MEP, Andreas was a consultant for the European Convention in the Department of European Affairs at Baden-Württemberg State Ministry in Germany. Andreas Swab, MEP, European Parliamentary Rapporteur for the Digital Markets Act. We look forward to your presentation. Well, Joyce, uh, thank you so much for this kind introduction and the ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my uh, utmost pleasure that you take the time today uh, and that you are going to listen to me how I want to present uh, the Digital Markets Act. Therefore, let me uh, come back immediately to what Joyce has been uh, speaking about in her introduction. Um, it's true that the story of the Digital Markets Act um, is longer than just the proposal of the European Commission in 2020, 
because in, in, the, in the end of the year 2020, the Commission came over uh, to the Parliament, came across with the proposal. Um, and uh, I was very happy that my colleagues have nominated the rapporteur in the Internal Market Committee. And then last year, I have worked hard to make, present a, a report that has then been adopted by my colleagues um, in November. And this year, we have been discussing with the uh, French presidency um, in uh, four trialogues um, on how to avoid um, a second reading of the law, because we have to make clear to our citizens and to those that listen to us that we are doing here a normal legal uh, procedure of creating a law under uh, the EU treaty. But uh, to be faster, we can shorten the first reading by agreeing already before the end of the first reading with the council, which is the group of all 27 ministers. Um, and that we have been achieving in these four meetings that we had at the beginning of this year. And therefore now in uh, May, so in four weeks, we will vote on the final text in the committee uh, with my colleagues from the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee. And then um, we will um, uh, go further to the plenary making sure that all colleagues of the European Parliament have the chance um, uh, to uh, participate and to support this. And uh, that will be then, so to say, the, um, the, the final step in the Parliament. But it will also be an important step um, for Europe, as the European Parliament is the directly elected representation of the people. And as I said, it's a story that is longer than 2020, because the European Parliament, and Joyce, you were so kind to remind us this already, the European Parliament has already in 2014 asked the European Commission to consider the unbundling of over-dominant platforms like search engines if there is no uh, competition, is there, if there is no variety of services. And why have we come to that uh, conclusion in 2014 already? Because we are strongly convinced that competition is good not only for companies and the economy, but also for the society, because the more competitors you have, the more opinions there are, and the more variety of services you will get, and the more people will try to invent and to invest their, themselves into new ideas. And therefore, it's of utmost importance that we always make sure that our economies are some sort of mirror of the society, and the more open and the more innovative we are, the better for all of us uh, as well, because we will have then uh, immediately a uh, return back of, of this openness. But for sure, in a social market economy, and then the Germans speak about soziale Marktwirtschaft, but I think this is a concept somehow that also in Ireland is, uh, is accepted. The social economy, the social market economy principle means that for sure you are in an open economy and you have the liberty to do whatever you want, but you have to abide by the law. And here we come to the problem. The European competition policy rules, they give quite a lot of freedom to companies. If they go against these uh, rules, then the European Commission or national competition authorities can go behind them. But that means that they have to prove to the companies that first of all, uh, there is a relevant market, but what is in the online world, the relevant market is very unclear that the, on that given market, the company had a dominant position. So they have to collect a lot of economic figures and that they had been misusing that dominance in that given market. This takes an awful lot of time. It's quite complicated. And then you have to go to court to prove all that. And that has been proving in the last years. Let's take the Google shopping case where we have lost 11 years. Um, this has been, proving, uh, been proven ineffective. And therefore we wanted already in 2014 to push the commission to go for more. But we had to wait six years for this. Uh, but finally, I think now we are there. But as you said, um, this is a long story. And it's based on the fact that we are in favor of innovation. We are in favor of small, medium-sized, and of big companies. We have no preference. But what we want to achieve is that there is a competition, that there are more ideas, more products, more services, and that users uh, can choose. So therefore, I would like to say where anti-competitive unfair behaviors become systemic, regulation is needed. And the European is the first, the European Union is the first area in the world to regulate systematically anti-competitive behavior. And therefore the DMA is absolutely historic. 
And I've said it's a new era of tech legislation. Well, we will have to see how the European Commission can apply it. But in any event, it will uh, put an end to that uh, uh, nitty gritty of application of general data protection rules in Europe, where every data protection uh, officer wanted to have a different opinion on, on the same matter. That is finished. We will have now out of one hand with one authority, the application of rules. And I think that is in the interest of consumers, of users, and also of companies. Uh, by the way, in, on all companies, um, even though some of the gatekeepers might have been critical at the beginning. So I hope, uh, uh, colleagues, that I've been able to give you already some sort of taste of the problem. And therefore, I will uh, try to um, now uh, go a bit into the details. The fundamental problems addressed by the DMA are um, that greater contest competition or contestability and the level playing field uh, in two-sided platform markets are the aim. That's what we want to achieve. Due to strong network effects on both sides of the market, on the consumer side and on the business side, gatekeepers have so far been able to, um, to set access and user rules that are most beneficial for themselves. And that is uh, the, the, the biggest and the most unfair, the unfairest uh, problem that we have in these markets. And that's what we want to break. So if a company has an excellent service and the users want to use it, we don't interfere. But if a gatekeeper has 27 or 28 services and only three of them are good, but he is trying to use the users of these three services to feed the other uh, 25 services uh, by excluding other competitors from being in the market, that is something that we want to stop. And therefore, there are in fact three key principles that the DMA is trying to fix. First, um, so the goal is clear, break open large ecosystems and allow for more competition in certain areas. And that is not direct consumer protection, but it's a midterm consumer protection because the more open the market gets, the better for consumer and users. And therefore, in the long run, in the midterm, everyone will profit. But at the beginning, there might be some um, ad um, adjustments needed and consumers and users might, uh, might be asked to uh, also make choices that they haven't seen before. They may have to choose what browser to use. They may have to choose what email program to enter into uh, the Android phone. And they may have to choose other stuff. So consumers might be challenged because they will have to go for a choice that so far they haven't had. But I think we believe that choice is something of importance. And with that choice, we want to give, put an end to too much self-preferencing. Self-preferencing is a, a, when a gatekeeper ecosystems, gatekeepers give preference to their own services. Other competitors are contractually excluded, for example, in payment systems or own products are better placed, like in the Google Shopping case. So if you are looking for some sort of t-shirt uh, in the Google search engine, you are looking for a Joyce O'Connor t-shirt. I don't know if this exists, Joyce. Uh, and, you put that, and you put that into the Google search engine that you then get the results of Amazon, eBay, and whatever Zalando or Irish shopping platform, and not only of uh, the gatekeeper's own services. The second element that we want to fix with the DMA is that we want to avoid that conflicts of interest are um, ignored. On the one hand, large platforms provide the platform for business customers. On the other hand, they compete with business customers. In doing so, they exploit the data of all their business customers against them and to the advantage of the gatekeeper. And that is not fair. For example, Amazon optimizes its sales strategy for Amazon Basics, uh, the products are based on the business data of competitors who use Amazon Marketplace to sell the same products there. Um, and in the analog economy, that would not be allowed. And in the digital economy, it shouldn't be neither. And the third element, we are going now far away from the uh, Joyce O'Connor t-shirt, uh, we come to data leveraging. And here as well, uh, let's imagine um, that um, the platform that we are using, I think is Zoom, is now knowing that um, uh, the, speci the specific user choice is sitting in front of your computer somewhere because they can see which computer is, is used, a, a mobile handheld or a normal computer. And they are knowing she's in her office. She's speaking about European uh, affairs. And uh, she's uh, maybe looking on her mobile phone um, on a restaurant uh, in Belfast or in uh, Cork. Um, and um, the combination of these data have for sure a value. 
And mm -hmm. if this combination of data is not even accepted uh, under GDPR, it's already a legal problem. But if this combination is all the time only limited within the gatekeeper services, it's an impediment of competition and also that we want to fix. These are the three main lines to make it very easy to be understood. Um, but uh, we can come now to a bit more uh, of details. And, and I'm very happy uh, to come to questions soon. Uh, there are three more points that I want to address uh, to give uh, you a short introduction. What we wanted to do is to avoid red tape for innovators, for um, startups, because um, the digital world is already complicated enough with algorithms and data. We don't want to create bureaucracy. Therefore, we have been focusing only on those companies that are a real problem to the market. And these are the gatekeepers. And gatekeepers are defined because they control bottlenecks. They have core platform services that are so important that users and businesses cannot avoid to use them. For example, Google search. And these gatekeepers are defined now in the Digital Markets Act as companies that have uh, um, a large effect on the single market. 7.5 revenues, um, 75 billion market capitalization or 7.5 billion of revenues per year. Um, and they need uh, at least 45 million monthly active users um, and 10,000 business users. And they have to have that what we have been calling core platform services, email services, um, cloud services, um, browser, uh, search, whatever. Um, to make sure that we really focus on the right ones. And if a company has these services, so we are speaking about the GAFAM and maybe Alibaba and, uh, um, and TikTok, maybe other companies could come uh, in to the uh, basket as well, like, like, like Booking or Spotify. And um, then they have to follow the rules after the application process has been finalized of the Digital Markets Act. And these rules are specified in Article 5 and 6, there are rules and obligations, so do's and don'ts, um, and they have to follow these rules. Um, and uh, these rules are quite detailed, but there are also some future-proof uh, and open uh, rules that the European Commission will have to define. In any event, the procedure will be with the European Commission uh, that is located here in, in Brussels, in Belgium. Um, in the middle of Europe, and the European Commission has to make sure that the gatekeepers respect these rules. Now, maybe very quickly um, to come to some of these rules. Um, there are stronger regulation of data combination practices. I have mentioned it already. Consent is required for tracking across third party websites. GDPR remains unchanged, but will be also now under the control in competition policy terms of the European Commission. Interoperability has been an issue because we have been saying that sometimes in very strongly, um, 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 how to say, uniformly assessed markets, also interoperability can help to open up uh, competition. Uh, more stringent transparency of obligations in advertising market is, is there, good for advertisers and publishers and good for the transparency of publishing. Vertical interoperability for variables, side loading and choice screens, consumers will have much more choice. And the enforcement, as I said, will be done by the European Commission. The European Commission can, if companies don't respect the rules, go for strong fines for, especially if, if it's not only a one uh, bad behavior, but a repeated bad behavior, the commission can even use structural remedies uh, in case of systematic non-compliance. And for example, also a merger ban. Um, and as I mentioned, the European Commission is the enforcer of the act. And therefore, we place a lot of trust into the European Commission um, as the government of the European Union, so to say, to enforce these rules fairly, but strongly. Um, and we as a European Parliament will, as I said, give final green light to that probably in July of this year. And then we will follow the actions of the European Commission. And I'm very much interested, um, Joyce, colleagues uh, in Ireland, what you think about that and how you assess these measures. Um, that have in, indeed um, needed to overcome more than 1,200 amendments, uh, a lot of committee and shadows mm -hmm. meetings, a lot of technical meetings, a lot of uh, discussions. But what was amazing was that this black hole of uh, argument, it's the algorithm stupid, has been also by companies made much more transparent to me and to my colleagues. And like mm -hmm. that, we have much better understood the complexity of the rules 
the complexity of the business practices, and also the complexity of data in that uh, context of gatekeeping companies. And I would like to quote at the end that The Economist uh, last or two years ago has written um, that it's not true that data is the new oil of the economy. Data is like sunshine for the economy. So you cannot live without daylight. And that's a bit the digital logics. You cannot live without data. Um, and therefore, we have to be very careful that data are something that is accessible to uh, companies um, and that data is something that users also allow companies to be used, but that gatekeepers don't control alone. And like that, I'm looking forward to our exchange. Thank you so much. Thank you.